So let's have a conversation that will offend literally everyone, at least a few times, but hopefully build towards a better understanding of the greatest commandment in the Bible. It's time to ask, what does the Bible really teach about homosexuality? Now, regardless of what men want, how can Christians base our standards on God's word as written? How can we respect his standard over tradition or popularity? And for now, we'll just focus on orientation as identity is an entirely different conversation. So first, we'll go to the famous example in Genesis 19, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The general situation is two angels are sent to investigate the sins of the cities of Sodom, and the men of the city surround the house, threatening to sexually assault the people they believe to be random travelers. And the city is utterly decimated in response. But is this a general condemnation of homosexuality? No, not necessarily. Ezekiel 16 is quite graphic in its reasoning for its judgment, and verse 49 clearly shows the problem with Sodom and Gomorrah. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. That's the guilt of sodomites, not, you know, sodomy. It was how the strangers were horrifically abused that brought their judgment, not just the genders of the people involved. And what's translated into the men of the city is the Anshi Ha'ir, the people of the city. So no, the sodomites were not destroyed for being sodomites, but for being so depraved that Lot and his daughters were the most righteous in the city, not exactly bastions of morality themselves. Okay, so let's go to the second area. Leviticus is more specific, and it contains two passages. Leviticus 18.22 you shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. And in Leviticus 20, 13, if there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. They shall surely be put to death and their blood guiltiness is upon them. That certainly sounds like a strong condemnation if I've ever seen one, and it is but again, not necessarily of what you think. The word for female here is isha, specifically a woman or wife. It comes from the masculine base, ish, a man or a husband. And ish is not the word here described as male, but zakar, a male, generally a boy. Particularly with the differentiation in chapter 20, if an ish or man lies with a zakar, a male, generally a boy, it is a detestable act deserving of death. And, and yeah, that's, that's, that's fair. And that's all I'm seeing in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, but let's look at the Greek. The third example is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. Sure, the English is clear, but this wasn't written in English, and we need to take a closer look at those last two terms, malachi and arsinokite. Now, malachi means fine or delicate ones, which is a common Greco-Roman euphemism for a catamite, which I cannot explain without an enraged, expletive-filled rant, so you're going to have to look that one up yourself if you're rusty on that period of history. This also gives context to the second term, arsinokite, which means boy better, Basically the same concept condemned in Leviticus, everything involved with pederasty. Of course, that's not how the Roman church wanted this verse translated for some reason. Anyways, let's move on to the fourth one. 1 Timothy 1.10 goes on with a similar list of generally bad stuff. It says, And immoral men, and homosexuals, and kidnappers, and liars, and perjurers, and everything else that is contrary to sound teaching. Just like the list of people who will not inherit in God's kingdom, the first three terms are pornis, what who sells themselves, arsinokites, boy betters again, and andropodistes, one who forcefully enslaves other people. You can look this up in Strong's G4205, G733, and G405. Again, one could make an argument to try to include general homosexuality, but given the context of the combination of terms, Age and enslavement seem to be more relevant factors than just the gender. Finally, we get to Romans 1, 26 and 27. Because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lusts. Even their women 
gave up natural sexual relations for unnatural ones, and in the same way men also abandoned the natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, this is the only verse I can find that seems to actually deal with homosexuality in general, as the same word, apart from conjugation, is used to describe both parties on equal terms. But we also can't ignore that this doesn't describe a monogamous committed relationship being punished by God, but describes the act of being inflamed with lust and receiving in themselves the due penalty. So realistically, this could just be a functional warning that rampant promiscuity and orgies common in Greek and Roman society is how you get STDs. However, for the people I haven't defended in a while, while these verses have some additional context that I believe makes more sense, it would be negligent to simply disregard the typical interpretation as well. Perhaps homosexual actions could be against God's law. We can't simply ignore that. God does still have the right to judge, no matter how we rationalize things. But even then, we can go back to the context of that First Timothy passage. Maybe general homosexuality is intended to be listed. Either way, the context presented in verse 8 that introduces that list of generally bad stuff says, Now we know that the law is fine if one applies it properly, recognizing that the law is made not for the righteous man, but for this list of sinners which may or may not be intended to include homosexuals in general. But whoever it does intend to include, they are not who the law is meant to condemn, but for who the law is made for. Micah 6.8 He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Matthew 7, 1 and 2, do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way that you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will also be measured to you. Romans 13, 8 through 10, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. On the other hand, the fruitage of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, mildness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So does the Bible actually say that homosexuality is a sin? M maybe. We can't just say no for sure, but the original text is nowhere near as explicit as how people interpret their English King James. What is absolutely explicit and consistent is the commandment for us to love our neighbor and show the forgiveness that we rely on. Homosexual actions may indeed be a sin, but even if it is, we would be the ones committing the sin of the sodomites by being arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned, not helping those in need. And there are far more passages like Matthew 5, 38 through 48, or Matthew 22, 35 through 40, John 8, 7, Hebrews 13, 1 through 5, and Galatians 5, 14. But I'm going to wrap this up with Matthew 9, 9 through 13. It says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners.